It's really weird that we exist in a time where all these decades-long series are becoming further cemented in the cultural landscape through remakes, sequels, and legacy movies. But what's especially weird about it is that for as groundbreakingly atypical as these series were before they were a household name, the remakes always tend to just on a technical level look so… safe. Not like bad by any means, but it's clear that at this point they've established a house style and they're sticking with it. No more fun March hair sakugo, we gotta make sure everything is as uniform and grounded as possible. How else are we supposed to suspend our disbelief if the hair weebles a bit too wobbly? It's a very tired conversation that I won't dwell any further on, but the main hook here is that it's just strange that there's so many IPs obsessed with having everything look just right, especially in the animation sphere. Enter Calendars. They're big, functional, and do an okay job of reminding you when to pick up the kids from karate. I'm sure it's weird to think about for the youngins watching, but physical calendars used to be an absolute household staple. A guaranteed Christmas gift in a time before smartphones. And calendar companies absolutely took advantage of this necessity, releasing an absolute glut of calendars appealing to anyone and everyone. They're like dogs? Cats? Nuns having fun? Just a lot of mom and dad core calendars flooding your local mall kiosks from the months of October to December. But those categories of calendar weren't nearly as saturated as the ones for newspaper comics. Considering stuff like daily calendars needing a new graphic for literally every day of the year, newspaper comics were practically a shoe in for the format. So the longer running, the better. Peanuts, The Far Side, the one that got cancelled because the author willingly came out as a piece of human garbage, there's just so many! But the one I would always gravitate to as a kid were the Garfield calendars. Every year is a blessing when you got a new orange fat kid to look forward to every month, D -d -d don't take that out of context. But daily calendars featuring a prominent newspaper comic were like the low hanging fruit for calendars. An easy dunk pairing a daily thing with a daily format. Like, this was some square peg in the square hole thinking. You want to see some truly inspired galaxy brain masterpieces, you go to the monthly calendars. It was in these releases that newspaper IPs started to get really creative, presenting their cast of characters in new, unique ways, and just really stretching what their characters can look like when removed from the preconceptions of their world to just exist as a single concept to be presented from month to month. What you have with the premise of monthly calendars is 12 opportunities to present your characters in quite literally any way you can think of, and you better believe they took advantage of that. Sometimes. Admittedly, the Garfield brand played it safe more often than not with these releases, but once in a blue moon, they'd really knock things out of the park. The 1987 Garfield calendar is a good example of this, with each month being a depiction of an entry from Garfield's diary. Since when did Garfield keep a diary? Who cares, it was the perfect framing device for some really standout works from both Kevin Campbell and Mike Fence, both ending up becoming longtime artists for Paws Inc., the studio and production company made to support Garfield as a brand. The sheer level of detail in each image really captures the cast in a way that's both timeless and weirdly classy. Mmm. See that? That's a pure unadulterated serif font. Keep in mind that at this point it's been 9 years since Garfield's debut, so there did exist a fan base that was willing to see some experimentation with the property. And this calendar really gets that vibe across perfectly, each painting really dripping with a sense of artistic maturity that's both nostalgic for the series while still willing to quite literally paint Garfield in a new light. Like, look at how small he looks in some of these. Look, he can fit right into the potted plant! Look at him do irreparable property damage, this is amazing! And there's literally decades worth of other calendars to sift through, each with their own fun little gimmick. Checking with the 25th anniversary Garfield hardcover, it seemed like the creative staff at Paws Inc. really did make an effort when it came to every calendar release. Well, effort. Apparently the 1992 one was originally a book they ended up turning into a calendar premise. The success of that calendar in turn seems to have had later Garfield calendars use that same strat but in reverse, with the calendars being used as a backdoor pitch for a book deal later down the line. You've got 1995's from Garfield with Love, 96's In a Perfect World, 99's Garfield Predicts. Like they're not exactly my favorites, but I get and respect their intent with these but oh, oh wow. <laughs> it just, they just don't look like it is. <laughs> Hey, good on whoever did the flavor text. So while there clearly was a rift between, uh, artistic and editorial intent, I do feel like a few Garfield calendars fall in that comfy middle ground where, yeah, you can kinda tell cruise control was on, but it was still a fun product in the moment. The Garfield equivalent of a new Super Mario Bros, if you will. Stuff like 1988's Year of the Party really captures that Garfield house style, while still offering enough depth to stand as its own product. Plus, I actually enjoy the running gag of ridiculous party themes to commemorate the first 10 years of Garfield. 1990's 100% Pure Garfield has these bright colors and diagonal lines that capture that early 90s aesthetic perfectly, and the line art being colored really makes the characters pop. It actually reminds me a bit of the 2019 cartoon in that regard. Later entries like In a Perfect World and Garfield Predicts pretty much takes that general art style and brings some depth to it. 
The 2D style with that added shading reminds me of whenever TV shows get a movie tie-in. Everything's just detailed enough to justify seeing the cast in a different medium. Other entries, like 1989's calendar, really begin to elevate and set a precedent for what these calendars are capable of. Brother to fellow Garfield artist Mike Fence, Larry Fence, really flexes his watercolor skills here, presenting Garfield in these soft tones in a more rustic environment, making for a really calm, soothing vibe. Uh, vibey vibe, if you will. 1995's From Garfield Would Love calendar aims for a similar sense of serenity, using a more colored pencil style to capture your otherwise more expected Garfield moments, but also a couple moments evoking a real human aspect. Scenes like Garfield under the umbrella with a mice, or staying up tending to Pookie, or even waking up early with John, cover the broad range of how people define love while its slightly exaggerated, bouncier art still keeps things feeling very Garfield-y every step of the way. Like I get there's still images, but Larry Fence and Brett Koth both nail that sense of squash and stretch in the character designs that you typically associate with something actually animated. Meanwhile, 1994's calendar really leans into an action-oriented motif, reimagining the Garfield cast as classic mythological characters. The blended watercolor and gouache style really feels like the typical 2D Garfield style pushed to its absolute limits. You've got various monster and creature designs, and a keen attention to detail while still maintaining an overall feeling of fun. Mike Fence really knocked it out of the park on this one, probably one of my favorites. Going off of covers, the more experimental styles look to drop off after around 2002, which is a real shame since the 90s entries felt like they figured out the perfect balance between the comic style and something a bit more substantial. And uh, speaking of substantial so beautiful. I think just objectively, the standout Garfield calendars to date have been the 1987, 97, 2003, and 2007 calendars. While each of these were made as an anniversary milestone of some sort, it should be noted that Garfield's first strip was in 78, so the timing for the 10th, 20th, and 30th anniversaries don't quite line up. Like, I can only assume this is all one big attempt to cover up the 87 calendar being a year early for the 10th anniversary, and they've just committed for too long to change it at this point. Either way, these are some absolutely beautiful pieces. Mike Fence returned on all these calendars to really own the craft he started with that 1987 calendar. Truly an unsung hero in the greater Garfield franchise as a whole. The 97 calendar is a mashup with Norman Rockwell hand painting and digitally inserting Garfield into notable Rockwell paintings. It's like a slightly less tacky version of those graphic tees that combine unrelated pop culture IPs. It should also be noted that the idea for this project was executed previously back in 1987 as a piece in the Saturday Evening Post, a few of those entries back then being updated versions with more realistic Garfield art. It's an interesting project, but also I can't help but think why Rockwell of all artists was chosen. Were the two really on the same level in terms of slice of Americana? The 2003 calendar actually came out in time for Garfield's 25th anniversary, and boy did they make sure you knew it. You've got 25th anniversary calendar proudly displayed on the front, with the trend of the realistic painted style continuing, capturing the cast in really lush backgrounds ranging from gardens to farms to the original gotcha game, fishing. On top of that, you have the number 25 snuck into each piece, further cementing the anniversary year. Between this and the anniversary book itself, a lot was done to commemorate Garfield's 25th. 2007 rounds out the realistic Garfield run, with the cast inserted into works like Rene Marguerite's Son of Man, Salvador Dali's The Persistence of Memory, and Thomas Gainsborough's The Blue Boy. Maybe they think they just exhausted the art mashup concept, but I really do wish something of a similar caliber was done at least for the major anniversaries, because uh... They really settle into autopilot after this one. Like, how are you gonna have a 35th anniversary calendar with the original Garfield design on the cover and not have any of the months play with that idea? Both the 35th and 40th anniversary calendars do redraw some panels from older strips in full color, but it really feels like a step down from what they've done in the past. But the biggest disappointment has to be from last year's calendar. 2023 was supposed to mark 45 years of Garfield, and yet what do we get? Nothing. Not only was the calendar itself just full of generic promotional art, but the anniversary itself was treated with little to no fanfare. In America, anyway. I've seen the English language logo for Garfield's 45th anniversary, complete with Nickelodeon's logo ever since they acquired Paws in 2019, and yet the context I've seen it in has always been in international projects. You have China's Garfield exhibit, Japan's pop-up shows, Malaysia had a running event, even the motherland had him at SM Mall for a few days. Browsing western circles, I could only find this half-hearted Jim Davis interview, an alternate cover for the Kaboom comics, an Instagram post, and a... Uh, Garfield being playable in Nick Brawl 2, which was released way too late into the year to really count as any kind of Garfield anniversary project. I can only assume Sony's 2024 movie was supposed to be released for the anniversary, but Nick buying the series on top of a global panini just slowed things a bit.
In a time when people are really starting to pay mind to art possibly becoming lost media if given substandard treatment, I do think that there's something to be said about that including calendar art as well. For a lot of these pieces, these are the only times they've been seen in print, which is honestly a real shame. Newspaper comics are already seen as these disposable properties we take for granted, and doubly so with something like calendars, which quite literally have a shelf life of one year. Looking back at these isn't only a portal to an IP at a very specific point in their life, but like miniature art galleries in their own right. Spotlighting artists that aren't necessarily given props, since audiences tend to credit franchise art to either their creator or, worse, their company. Calendars give that opportunity to right that wrong, or to at least course correct for the moment these calendars still exist. Doing a quick Google search, it's become clear that these are definitely products that rarely see the light of day, even in the most niche corners of the internet. So I've slowly made it a personal project to scan each calendar I get my hands on and add it to a digital archive. The link's in the description, and it's still a work in progress, but until something like an art book comes out, this'll be the best bet we're looking for these online. Did I really just make a video justifying buying outdated calendars and complaining about an anniversary nobody remembered?